summer is in full swing, especially here in Houston. And Brooklinen is here to help you swap out winter warmth for easy breezy comfort with their award-winning sheets and home essentials. According to Wirecutter and Good Housekeeping, Brooklinen has the best in-class bedding. So if you don't trust me or their 100,000 five-star customer reviews, you know that these experts have done the research. Brooklinen uses only the highest quality materials for all of their products, such as long staple cotton, so everything they create is built to last. Hey everyone, Courtney here. And if you didn't know, I was born and raised in upstate New York. And since moving to Houston, I find myself getting so hot at night, even with the AC on. For me personally, I need to be cool at night to get a good night's sleep. And I found that your bed sheets can really affect your temperature at night. After sleeping on Brooklyn and sheets, I've noticed that I don't heat up at night and that I'm actually sleeping through the night because I'm not hot. These sheets really make me feel like I'm back home in New York. So shop in store or online at brooklinen.com today to give yourself the cooling sleep that you deserve this summer. Use promo code over 50 for $20 off your online purchase of $100 or more plus free shipping on brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Use promo code over 50 for $20 off plus free shipping. Thanks, Brooklinen. Now that we're in the thick of summer, and that can mean for a lot of us, a lot of moving and shaking. So sometimes we could be shuffling kids or grandkids places. There are travel plans, pool events, just different things to do. And maybe going to the grocery store and meal prepping just isn't on your list or it's not making the best use of your time. Well, now you can take part in Factor. It's America's number one ready to eat meal kit that is delivered straight to your door. And the wonderful thing is they've got so many different types of meals for so many different types of appetites or diets or whatever it is that you're looking for. All their food is fresh. It's never frozen. It's ready in just two minutes. Ship to your front door, you heat it and you eat it. I mean, it doesn't get simpler than that. Head to factormeals.com slash Dominique50 and use code Dominique50 to get 50% off. That's code Dominique50 at factormeals.com slash Dominique50 to get 50% off. Hi, welcome to today's episode of Over 50 and Flourishing. My guest today is Dr. Mary Claire Haver. She is board certified as an OB-GYN. She's also certified in culinary medicine from Tulane University. I have to tell you, you know, back in 2021, she completely shifted her practice and she decided to open up a wellness clinic dealing specifically for women going through menopause, realizing there was such a void in this area. She has now amassed more than 3 million followers across all of her social media platforms by posting advice on how to go through menopause. And she is no stranger. If you are on Instagram or social media, she is out there posting three, sometimes five times a day, getting her information out. She happens to live in Galveston, Texas, which is about 50 miles south, and she took the time to drive in and be my guest today. I am so happy that you're with me today. You know, if if you don't follow Mary Claire Haver on social media, you don't know what you're missing out on, okay? This woman blows up my Instagram feed. I mean, <laughs> you, I don't know how many times a day you record, but it feels like at least 10 because every time I'm scrolling, I'm getting another menopause tip or another diet tip or another, like, does, how does she sleep? You know, how does she work? I mean, really, you have, you have taken what, what everybody knows as the way to message and you have used it to the best of your ability to get the word out there. And I'm, I'm so thrilled to see you blow up the way that you have. It's awesome. It's been really exciting. And, you know, who knew that my superpower would have been taking complicated medical information, condensing it into a 30 second soundbite and like sending it out into the world in a way that people can understand and feel connected with the menopause story. Did your kids help you at all with this experience? Absolutely. So when I first 
started with a toe in the water, it was on Facebook. That's yeah. where our generation is. That's where everyone started. And they kept saying, mom, you know, you should get on TikTok. You should start doing these little shorter things. Cause I was doing really long videos. Right. And I was like, no, people just dance on TikTok. That's not a thing. <laughs> and so it was COVID. And so they kind of coached me a little bit. And so I did a couple of trial videos and to see what would happen. And like overnight I was getting 10,000 views, you mm -hmm. know, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is really Working. a thing. And so I really let the audience guide the content. You know, they would ask questions and right. I would just answer them. So what for me with the Galveston diet started out as just a conversation around nutrition, menopause and, and weight gain really explode into a much bigger conversation about menopause. Yeah, no, it has really taken off. I mean, the timing is ripe for all of this. And I've got your book. <laughs> Of course, read through it, love it in so many ways, but I, I have to share such a, a funny and personal story. So we're both from the same area. You're mm -hmm. from, is it Seabrook or Galveston? I live or, in Galveston. You live yeah. in Galveston. Okay. So I'm here in Houston. And for those of you who don't know, Galveston is our seaside community about literally from my door, about 50 minutes yep. away, right? So growing up, my mother and I would go to Stuart Beach every weekend. And then it was, of course, shopping at Colonel Bubby's, the mm -hmm. army surplus store. Mm -hmm. And then it was eating, you know, Guido's. Mm -hmm. And when you think about Galveston, you don't necessarily think about the healthiest of food. Right. You know, it's usually <laughs> fried something, fried shrimp, fried fish. Um, so I love how you have taken your home and your space. But the Galveston diet really is a connection to you and not so much the food that I was accustomed to eating, right, in right, Galveston. Right. So tell me about your medical journey because that's where you're from and it's where you studied. So I um, actually was born in Louisiana, mm -hmm. grew up there. I'm Cajun, yep. if that, you know, talk about different forms of eating that yes. may not be considered to be all that healthy. I grew up in the restaurant business. So I'm from the Landry family that has spawned multiple restaurants and now owned by Fertitta. Sure. And, um, but that originally started with my family. I didn't want to have anything to do with the restaurant business or food preparation or meals. And it's funny how it's come full circle for mm -hmm. me. So I started out as a geologist. Um, it's where I met my husband, um, who is an engineer and then went to medical school. After med school, I decided to pursue OB-GYN yep. as my training program and fortunately got my top choice at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Right. So we have lived there off and on in the Galveston-Houston area since 1998. Have We've raised our kids there. You know, they both graduated from the local high school, have gone back to Louisiana for college, mm -hmm. um, but now my oldest is starting medical school back at UTMB, where it all started. Isn't that neat? So it's it's sort of come full circle for them as well. Mm -hmm. That's got to be something very, very special to it see. It is. It is. Yeah. I, you know, in reading your book, it's so funny what leads us to our journey and our purpose. And it was sort of a, a trifecta for you in, in not such pleasant ways. I mean, I learned, you know, you struggled with food, nutrition, and weight issues, right, going through perimenopause, mm -hmm. um, you experienced a horrible trauma in losing your brother to liver failure. Mm -hmm. and, and then also you were going through just god-awful menopausal symptoms at the same, same time. time. So it was this perfect storm. And and you you even said in your book, you know, that you're, you almost heard your brother speaking to you saying, come on, you know, you can do this differently. So explain to everybody what was going on in your life and why you felt like you were derailing and, and how this got you back on track. So like you said, trifecta, I had, you know, a very emotionally traumatic death in the family of someone I was very, very close to for a young person. Yes. You know, he was 56 years old when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And then combined with my own menopause, of which I thought, kind of like I approached labor, yeah. where, well, an epidural is available, and I'll get it if I think I need it. By the way, I got it at three centimeters, you know. Exactly. <laughs> once, now, 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 now. Once the real pain <laughs> really set in, I was like, I'm no one's hero. We're going to yeah. do this. And so menopause, I really just thought I would tough, tough through it. Yeah. I, I, you know, really had not learned much outside of my residency training for multiple reasons, and I talk about a little bit in the book, mm -hmm. of 
there just not isn't a lot of continuing medical education in the American Board of OB-GYN on menopause. And I, my brain was kind of stuck with the Women's Health Initiative study, which made yes. us really fear, a lot of fear mongering around the safety Huge. around hormone therapy. So I thought, well, you know, I've got so much cancer in my family, maybe it's a better idea if I see if I can just, you know, get through this without it. And so here I am trying to muscle through what I think will make me a tougher person. Mm. I'm not sleeping. I'm having horrific symptoms. The weight gain is affecting me, you know, not only my health, but emotionally, yes. you know, my physical health, my emotional health. And then, you know, dealing with the grief. And so some of the symptoms that I was experiencing, I was attributing to my grief, the loss of sleep, the emotional ability, the not the, the, the brain fog. I just thought, you know, this is all part of mourning my brother. Yeah. And and certainly there was part of that was that. But then once I felt the grief lift after about six months, the symptoms persisted. And I thought, my God, this is menopause. Mm -hmm. And I'm an ob -gen. Like, how did I not how did I miss see this? this? Yeah. And what was really bringing me to the table of wanting to learn more, I mean, unfortunately, it was a vanity thing with the weight gain and not being able to get it off. And so I had enjoyed being thin. Trust me, I'd had, you know, that thin privilege for mm -hmm. most of my adult life. And then when faced with the simple tricks and things that I used to do to get the 5, 10 pounds off, now it was 20 pounds, was not working. No matter what I did, no matter how much I dieted, no matter how many times I went to the gym, it would not stay off. And that's when, like, the realization of I need to look at this differently. You know, I need to calorie counting is just not working for mm -hmm. me and I'm not getting healthier. Right. And so that's kind of what opened my mind to let me do some more research here as far as reading articles outside of my normal box of things mm -hmm. that I understand and see what I can learn and find. And that's how the tenets of the Galveston diet were formed. Yeah. There's a line in your book, you know, the, the line from the movie, you had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> when I read this line, I'm like, she has me at hello. You say nutrition is the most underutilized medication mm -hmm. yet is the most effective. And I love the fact that you equate nutrition to medication because I've always believed that food is pure medicine for our body or it's poison for our body. And so talk about how you got to that epiphany and that, you know, in all of this too, you talk so much about kind of the visceral belly fat, which is, the, which is the area where women struggle so much, so much. in menopause, because it's like whew, the weight just goes right there. So if we're seeing food as medicine, how are we then using it to eliminate what it is that's bugging us so much? So one of the things I learned in my studies was that there are, you know, we have different types of fat, different places we deposit fat in the body and they actually are very, very different. Mm -hmm. So subcutaneous fat is the fat that we've known our whole lives. It gives us curves. It gives us cellulite. We don't like it because it can be cosmetically distressing in certain right. areas, but really in, in normal, healthy amounts, it is not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Visceral fat is different. Visceral fat is the intra-abdominal fat that wraps around our internal organs and gives many of us that apple kind of shape. Mm -hmm. um, and so what a lot of my patients were complaining of and what I was noticing was new fat deposits in the, you know, look, feeling pants not fitting, looking yes, tight, bigger, looking pregnant. Like yeah. patients would come in and, and grab their tummies and shake them at me and say, what is this? Like, mm -hmm. this is new. I've never had this before, even postpartum, you know, even in the biggest I've ever been, this was never an issue. And mm -hmm. when I did a deeper dive and looked at the latest research, part of what's happening with aging as well as combined for females is menopause, the, you know, the loss of our ovarian hormones, we see a much bigger drive of fat to the intra-abdominal cavity than we ever did before. So besides we don't like it, mm -hmm. it's metabolically dangerous. It's a much more met metabolically active fat. It is an it creates massive amounts of inflammatory mm -hmm. cytokines, which the more inflamed you are, the more you have insulin resistance, the higher your cortisol levels are. Like yep. you get in this horrible neg negative feedback cycle of seeing inflammation go up and more fat being driven to the abdomen, which it just you just wake up and you're like, why can't I fix this? Yes. And it turns out that there's not really a medication that's helpful for this. Mm -hmm. Um, and just by simple nutritional changes, 
we can affect this on a much bigger basis. And there's some great nutritional strategies that have been tested in menopausal women that have been shown to work. Yeah. So now that we've embraced this concept that food is medicine, and that was your approach to the Galveston diet and how you were going to remedy your own situation, what was the magic formula that you came up with? Because as you know, there are diets and fats. Remember the right. 80s, everything was low fat. That was the biggest setup for failure, by the way, ever. Today, you hear about paleo, you hear about keto, you hear about Mediterranean. So I think women feel confused. So right. just give me your ratio and what you discovered. So when I, you know, certain tenants started popping up in the research and I was like, let me focus on lowering inflammation through nutrition. And, and what, what is the research showing when we look at this? And so the first thing was there was some really good data coming out at, as far as neuroinflammation and neurodegenerative disease and general systemic inflammation around intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of talk on intermittent fasting now. It's not a great way to lose weight. I never recommend it just for weight loss mm -hmm. because you can undo all of the goodness of fasting in your eating window yeah. and undermine your choices. But fasting, and it affects people differently, but to some degree does appear to lower chronic inflammation rates and does appear to be effective at stopping that drive of visceral fat to the abdomen for women. Now, the studies that I utilize, that I found that really were helpful use the 16-8 pattern for mm -hmm. most of the patients. And so that is a 16-hour window of fasting and an eight-hour window of eating rather than the extended fast. So, yeah. um, so that's what I recommend if people want to give it a try. I'm like, we're going to start with 12, which is kind of where people naturally fall anyway. Sure. And then we're going to slowly advance that eating window over several weeks right. until you hit something that makes sense to you and your, and your schedule. It's not going to work if it doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. and, and then see how you feel with it. Right. So, and what's cool is that you get to decide mm -hmm. what that window is mm -hmm. and, and customize it for you. for you. We're going to take a real quick break because that's that's only, we're only like scratching the surface here. <laughs> There's so much more when it comes to, obviously you're wondering about fat and protein and carbohydrates and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. So we're going to dive into that. Um, my guest today is Dr. Mary Claire Haver with the Galveston Diet. She's also the queen of HRT and making everybody feel great in midlife. We'll be back right after this. Summer is in full swing, especially here in Houston. And Brooklinen is here to help you swap out winter warmth for easy breezy comfort with their award-winning sheets and home essentials. According to Wirecutter and Good Housekeeping, Brooklinen has the best in-class bedding. So if you don't trust me or their 100,000 five-star customer reviews, you know that these experts have done the research. Brooklinen uses only the highest quality materials materials for all of their products, such as long staple cotton. So everything they create is built to last. Hey everyone, Courtney here. And if you didn't know, I was born and raised in upstate New York. And since moving to Houston, I find myself getting so hot at night, even with the AC on. For me personally, I need to be cool at night to get a good night's sleep. And I found that your bed sheets can really affect your temperature at night. After sleeping on Brooklyn and sheets, I've noticed that I don't heat up at night and that I'm actually sleeping through the night because I'm not hot. These sheets really make me feel like I'm back home in New York. Brooklinen is the perfect way to build your own indoor oasis to escape the heat. The options are endless, so do yourself a favor of simplifying your shopping by bundling bed, bath, and both. You can save time and up to 25% when bundling your new favorite home essentials. So. Shop in store or online at brooklinen.com today to give yourself the cooling sleep that you deserve this summer. Use promo code OVER50 for $20 off your online purchase of $100 or more, plus free shipping on brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N dot C-O-M. Use promo code OVER50 for $20 off, plus free shipping. Thanks, Brooklinen. Now that we're in the thick of summer, and that can mean for a lot of us, a lot of moving and shaking. So sometimes we could be shuffling kids or grandkids places, there are travel plans, pool events, just different things to do. And maybe going to the grocery store and meal prepping just 
isn't on your list or it's not making the best use of your time, well, now you can take part in Factor. It's America's number one ready to eat meal kit that is delivered straight to your door. And the wonderful thing is they've got so many different types of meals for so many different types of appetites or diets or whatever it is that you're looking for. All their food is fresh. It's never frozen. It's ready in just two minutes. Ship to your front door. You heat it and you eat it. I mean, it doesn't get simpler than that. And if you're looking for maybe lower calorie options this summer, because you know we are in the swimsuit by the swimming pool, you can try all their delicious dietitian approved meals that are around 550 calories or less. They've got protein packed meals, they've got keto, they've got vegan and veggie. So let me tell you, there is something for everybody. But the key with factor is it just makes eating easy. So you can give yourself a little bit of break from the grocery store and the kitchen and the prep time and enjoy Factor Meals. Head to factormeals.com slash Dominique50 and use code Dominique50 to get 50% off. That's code Dominique50 at factormeals.com slash Dominique50 to get 50% off. Welcome back to Over 50 and Flourishing. My guest today is Dr. Mary Claire Haver. She has written a book called The Galveston Diet. For those of you who are in midlife and menopause and you have been dealing with weight gain and hormonal symptoms that just have you feeling not at all like you and wanting to live a better life, a healthier life, we are diving into this book and her remedies, recipes, all of it. But the key in what you've been talking about, we were talking about intermittent fasting mm-hmm. before the break. So you like the 16, eight model, mm-hmm. which means 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. Mm-hmm. And the, you like the flexibility people get right. to determine when that is. And you say that helps to reduce inflammation right. in the body. Right. That's a big part also of your meal plan. It's very anti-inflammatory. Right. So that's kind of the second component, you know, mm-hmm. tentative is choosing foods that naturally fight inflammation. So that means they're packed with things like fiber or magnesium and or magnesium and Mm -hmm. anthocyanins. And, you know, in in Galveston diet, we talk about eating the rainbow because every color has a different chemical compound naturally in it. That is a natural inflammation fighter for our fruits and veggies. Um, We talk about whole grains. We talk about, you know, and then looking at things that we know can be inflammatory. Now, everyone has their individual things that cause inflammation, and we mm-hmm. usually figure that out by the time we're adults. Like, I don't really do well with you know certain types of food. Yeah, or dairy. Um, or dairy, yes. you know. Now, dairy doesn't have to be inflammatory for everyone. Mm-hmm. I don't have an issue with it, but, you know, we try to be flexible in that you can, you know what's inflammatory for you, but there are foods we know that are inflammatory for everyone. Like what? So... One of the biggest actors is added sugars that are not in moderation. Mm -hmm. So we, each person has an individual threshold of kind of how much simple sugar that they can tolerate without setting off an inflammatory pathway. And women who tend to get 25 grams or less, that's about four tablespoons uh, or four teaspoons, sorry, Mm -hmm. of sugar um, in their diet per day have much less visceral fat than women who have more than that. And the number one um, source of added sugars in most um, diets in the U.S. is beverages. Yeah. So a lot of the sweetened juices. beverages, juices, the coffees, we love so much. So um, uh, some of the artificial colors and flavors in large amounts can be inflammatory. Some mm-hmm. of the way that meats are processed. I mean, we can take something that's relatively healthy, like a wheat kernel for mm-hmm. most people who don't have a gluten sensitivity. Um, and strip it of anything that's healthy, and all you're left with is is the germ, which is basically sugar. So by really focusing on added sugars, not fruits and vegetables, or, mm-hmm. or if you can tolerate dairy, that that God, I, I joke and say God put there. Well, he did, or she did. Sorry. And um, <laughs> so you know, and then the things that we add through cooking and processing, yes. limiting that to 25 grams per day, we tend to do much better. Yes. And alcohol is another yes, one. Yes. Alcohol. Huge. So a lot of those studies from the eighties that had shown some health benefits to alcohol are being walked back. Interesting. Quite Even a bit. Wine? So it used to be that wine was healthy mm-hmm. and you know, a certain amount of wine in moderation. But we really, now most people who are experts in this area, you far 
there is just a slippery slope and Mm -hmm. it is really hard to promote the health benefits of alcohol at this point with the latest research. Well, not to mention when you couple the fact with it totally wrecks your sleep when you're going through menopause. menopause, It's a nightmare. It's incredible. Like I, I've told my husband, I am looking cause he's sitting over there. Um, I told him, you know, I'm making the choice to not sleep when I have more than one glass of wine. Absolutely. You know, if we're out celebrating or doing something, I am literally making the choice because 3 a.m., 100% of the time I'm up yep. and I cannot go back to bed. Yeah. We're going to talk. We're, we've got uh, the other back half of this conversation <laughs> is going to be all about menopause for sure. Um, so in in helping your situation, mm-hmm. right, your frustration with where your body is going and, and you start making these changes and your study participants are now following this as well, you incorporate the intermittent fasting. What about that ratio of protein to fat to carbohydrate? What was your sweet spot? So I was looking, you know, I was experimenting with patients. I had all these volunteers in Facebook groups and we were all, you know, I knew I wanted to go a little bit lower carb because mm-hmm. so many of my patients and followers were talking about having, you know, sugar addictions. And when we really, I was like, keep a food journal. And we were really looking at what the sources, uh, where their nutrition was coming from or things that really weren't all that nutritious. And it looked like, we were, they were not getting enough healthy fats. They were not getting enough complex carbohydrates. They were not getting enough protein. So when I was setting the goals, Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's go a little bit lower carb and see how it goes. It was really just experimentation. And that seemed to be really the sweet spot. Now, when people come to my clinic, Mm -hmm. now I have a menopause clinic and I also have a body scanner, which is so exciting because I'm able to measure their muscle mass, how much visceral fat they have, how much subcutaneous fat they have. Then I'm able to really tweak their goals for them. So I really start with protein. Mm-hmm. One of the things that that I would, if I do another edition of the book, which will eventually happen, I'm really going to do a lot more explanation about the importance of protein with Absolutely. age and, and that we are not getting enough, mm-hmm. especially as women, and we're stacking our protein into one meal typically, yeah. which is dinner. Aren't we supposed to get, what What did I hear? Um, is it one gram per pound of body weight just so, to even maintain? So that's maintenance. And because yeah. of sarcopenia, the latest research I'm reading, what I'm prescribing to patients is about 1.5 mm-hmm. for every kilogram So it's 1.5 grams for every kilogram of lean body mass. So lean body mass, just take your goal weight, you know, and most women know what was your weight at 25 when you were your happiest, healthiest running around, you know. So like, look at that weight, assume most of that is muscle mass and not fat mass. And so set that weight divided by 2.2 and your followers can do this and then multiply that. So say, you know, 150 pounds would be your goal. So Mm -hmm. that's going to be around 75 kilos. I'm just picking numbers. So we're going to go one to 1.5. I pushed to 1.5. So that's Mm -hmm. going to be a little over a hundred grams of protein Protein. per day. To maintain. To maintain and possibly grow. Yeah. Most women are getting about 60. Yeah. That's so low. Which is not enough to keep your muscles strong. And muscle mass is everything for your health. It's everything for your health. It's, and, and again, even getting back to vanity in how you look, right? Because you you have to strength train in order to maintain and grow muscle you and must. to serve your bone. And then you need the protein in order for your muscles. You're feeding your muscles. Yes. Or mm-hmm. else it's going to burn other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, it's, I'm so glad the focus is on protein. I think it's so under-discussed in right. this age group, and especially as we age to to maintain strong, healthy bones and muscle, because right. that's that's what keeps you healthy. That's it. The other thing that I read too that I, I really loved was your percentage of fat. Fat, of fat just scares people because right. I think because we grew they, up in a low fat yes. world. Half the stuff in my fridge was low fat, margarine, right. you know, because my mom, that's what they were taught. All right. And it just turned out to be another fat. I think it was, I think it was they meant well, yeah. but the research just didn't really support it. And all we did was was create a more obesogenic society. Yep. So, so how much are you recommending? And then kind of walk us through the different kinds of fats that you believe sure. in. So somewhere in the 60 to 70% range when you're trying to do weight loss, I'll drop it down 50%. Mm-hmm. It depends on your level of activity. If I have someone who's training for marathons, we're going to go much higher. They need more carbohydrates sure. to fuel that you know, activity. So I really, as a, from a patient standpoint, I'm able to really drill down and give them more individualistic ideas. But you know, for a book, I don't know these people. I've never met you, so I just give percentage range. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about fat, 
we have saturated fat and we have unsaturated fat and they act very differently in the body typically. And so what we shoot for is a ratio of unsaturated to saturated fat, probably somewhere around two to one. If you could get to four to one, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. So the keto movement and the way keto kind of initially came out was all fat was kind of lumped together and all sugars were lumped together. Right. So what happened was, I mean, I love butter and bacon as much as the next person, <laughs> but this heavy, heavy, heavy reliance on saturated fats seem to be causing some, for some people, um, elevations in certain types of cholesterol mm -hmm. and not really health promoting as much as it could be where the unsaturated fats um, had other properties because they were coming from nuts and seeds. And, and so those also had fiber and micronutrients. It's really, you need to look at the entire food and what it's made of. So yeah. we advise people to try to shoot for about a two to one ratio of unsaturated fats from natural sources. Um, versus saturated fat. So that would be like plenty of avocado in yeah. a salad or lots of olive oil exactly. or, or different types of cold pressed oils for right. salads. And, and seeds and nuts and, you know, yes. if you can tolerate those things um, versus um, so much of the butter and bacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about carbohydrates because that's everybody's guilty pleasure. I mean, look, the bread mm -hmm. basket shows up and I'm just giving it the stink eye. It's the tortilla <laughs> chips. I, yeah. you know, it's tough. So, okay, what would you consider your ideal complex carbohydrates and what's your ratio there? So um, we are shooting for about 10 to 20%, you know, in the weight loss phase mm -hmm. of, comp of carbohydrates, heavy, heavy on the complex carbs. Yes. So your fruits, your vegetables, mm -hmm. your, your um, unprocessed whole grains as much as possible. Would that be like brown rice, quinoa? What kind of mm -hmm. falls in brown that Brown rice, quinoa, right. whole wheat, mm -hmm. you know, toast, whole wheat crackers, whatever. If you need some crunch, I love a Triscuit. Yeah. Um, they only have three ingredients. It's, you know, and so it's a great source of fiber. And I love the crunch. I love the salt, you know, and so that's kind of my go-to little crunchy snack yeah. that I like. Can we get enough nutrients in our food supply in what we're eating or do we need to supplement? That's a great question. Maybe. Yeah. It's hard. Some people can do it, uh, but the way we live our lives, having busy schedules and having very little time to meal prep, it can be um, a challenge. What I'm seeing amongst my patients and when I look at the data, where most people are struggling is in fiber, mm. um, is in omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. is in vitamin D. Um, probably 90% of my patients are deficient in vitamin D. Yeah. And I, I check blood levels on everyone. And so that is one of the most common supplements that I will recommend. I tell people, before we just rush off to supplement, mm -hmm. track your intake. Yeah. Just track what you eat normally for a couple of weeks and see where you fall. If you're running low on magnesium consistently, either try to up it through diet and nutrition or, and or add in a supplement. If you're running low on iron, you know, a lot of my patients are anemic or have low iron stores and we'll have a discussion around that. So I don't want, other than probably vitamin D and fiber, mm. I don't like to just blanket recommend. I don't have a multivitamin I recommend. Yes. You know, for myself personally, I'm able to get most of my nutrients through food. I do supplement fiber. I do take some collagen, not because I'm deficient in it, but because I'm looking for the health benefits. There's sure. some great studies on collagen and osteoporosis. And there's some other really great studies on certain types of collagen and skin, skin laxity. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that little connective tissue yeah. there holding everything together. Holding everything together. <laughs> right. So um, I also do take a magnesium supplement. Now, magnesium, you can supplement a deficiency. It also, in higher doses, can be medicinal. Yeah, to help you sleep at night, right? To help right? you sleep. So I take an altheronate, which has a really nice, it's readily absorbed and crosses through the blood brain barrier to help me with rest at night and decreasing some anxiety. Go over that again because there's there are several so different many, yes, so types many. of magnesium. So um, certain magnesium, they don't all work the same. Some are great at inducing, um, we use them for bowel preps, right? Mm. So they're great at inducing a bowel movement or cleaning out the colon because they don't really absorb in the bloodstream right. and they pull water in and help move things through. Um, there are others that are really good at raising up a blood level because they are readily absorbed, but they don't really cross the blood brain barrier the best. So it depends on what you're treating. And, but if you're going for anything with mental health or sleep, you're going to want a glycinate or an althuronate that will cross into the brain, brain and be able to be utilized there. 
Okay. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you clarified that because mm -hmm. I think there's so much confusion around there magnesium. Is. You just sit there and stare and you don't know what to get. And, and magnesium can cross react with certain medi prescription medications. So you always want to talk to your physician first. Right. Do you recommend um, doing this blood work before starting any type of a change in diet and meal plan, especially because we're talking about deficiencies? I mean, doesn't it help to target? So yes and no. If you don't have, not everyone has access to be able to go and get blood work done. Sure. And I, I can always recommend good nutrition, yeah. you know, for absolutely everyone. It doesn't have to be prescriptive. Um, but if you feel like you have maximized your nutrition, you're following most of the principles and you're still suffering, yeah. then that's the time that I would say, okay, let's get some blood work and see. We don't absorb vitamin D very well, especially with age. Mm -hmm. And vitamin D is a hormone and it's has hundreds of, of different reactions in the body. And health benefits. And Huge. yes, if you're deficient, you are not going to function the way you should. Right. Can following a diet like this help you going through menopause? So here's what we know. I've done no studies with Galveston diet mm -hmm. other than anecdotal. So all I can tell you is what my followers, my patients say. And you. But we've not done a randomized controlled study. Right. Okay. So... But when there's been observational studies in large populations that looked at the risk of hot flashes, mostly the easiest symptom in menopause to track are going to be hot flashes, night sweats, and mood disturbances. Yeah. When they looked at those populations, things that were high in the anti-inflammatory um, scale, like the Mediterranean diet, which is very similar to the Galveston diet, sure. except it's not in the Mediterranean. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's on the third coast, as we call it. Well, in Texas. we got the Gulf Coast. I <laughs> Gulf mean, we, coast. we do our best. <laughs> um, they tend to have less hot flashes, and mm -hmm. the less symptoms you have in menopause, actually, the less health risk you have as far as cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease as well. Wow. That's, that's powerful. So I guess a lot of people are going to wonder, okay, what would a day in the life of following the Galveston <laughs> diet be like? So, and, and what I love is that you've got, my goodness, you have a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. Yes, so we have several weeks of meal plans. You do. We have vegetarian options. Yes. We try to, you know, if you if you struggle with dairy or different, you know, food, we try to give you Remove options that. for that as well. Yeah. And again, these aren't, meal plans are not set in stone. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a, a su suggestion for you to go by. Okay. So kind of suggest what would a breakfast, a lunch, sure. and a dinner look so, like? So because I choose to fast in the morning, mm -hmm. like I'll walk you through my day. Yep. So I get up, I try to exercise in the morning and I do exercise fasted. Now I've been fasting for years. Mm -hmm. um, and then somewhere between 11 and 12, I'll break my fast. Now I am drinking plenty of fluids and I have black coffee right. in the morning. So I'll break my fast. One of my favorite ways is what we call the Mary Claire Parfait, which is Greek, plain Greek yogurt, mm -hmm. um, high in protein. So I'm trying to hit my 100 plus gram protein goal per day. Right. So I've got 20 grams of protein right there. I'm adding chia, flax, and hemp seeds for the omegas, the fiber, and extra protein with uh -huh. the hemp. Um, I'm going to throw some berries on there for flavor and fiber and anthocyanins. I'm going to mix in some nuts, again, for healthy fats and fiber. Yeah. That whole concoction is probably around 700 calories. Wow, that's a great way to start. All, that's a great way to start the yeah. day. And like that would have shocked me. Like I was mm -hmm. so low cal, be thin my whole life. I yeah. have sacrificed so much muscle in my 20s and 30s to be thin. Yeah. And now I'm paying for it. And so, yeah. and I, what the thing about I love about Galveston diet is I can eat. Right. That's <laughs> I'm the thing. Eating. It's non restrictive. Right. It's just what you're eating. Okay. So that sounds like a heavenly breakfast lunch. So I'm just, you yeah. know, putting that down. Yeah. Then I'll whip up my drink. So in my, um, I'll mix up my fiber and my collagen uh -huh. and make a giant 30 ounce and I'll get my supplements ready and I'll take those three after throughout the afternoon. And I'll try to have a high protein snack a couple of hours later. So if I'm at the office, I'll usually bring like a protein bar that's high in fiber, something like a Quest bar. Yeah. I don't love a lot of processed stuff, but again, I'm seeing patients back to back. You need to get and something I, in. Yeah. I need to get something in. Um, when we get home, then if it depends on the day, but I'll either have meal prep something um, that morning before we left. So we'll do, you know, uh, I love to meal prep beans because mm -hmm. the fiber and, you know, um, we'll grill some kind of a lean meat yeah. and I'll make a big salad, something green. We love Brussels sprouts, asparagus. I love to make a huge salad with tons of avocado. We'll have a side of fruit. We're not big dessert people. Yeah. Um, well, that so, wouldn't work on your plan anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have fruit for dessert and, um, and then, you know, snuggle up. 
Yeah. Watch some TV, read books. You know, the two of us now, we're empty nesting. Yeah. So we're, you know, settling in for the evening, try to have some tea and avoiding the wine when we don't, when mm -hmm. we're not celebrating something. And so, um, and go to bed, get up and do it all again the next day. That sounds like a great plan. It's, you know what, it sounds like such a doable plan and so healthy and like you said, not restrictive. You're not counting calories. You're not saying, okay, only five of you right. get to make it on God, my plate. I did that for a year, and it's we such a did. hard so mindset stupid. to break. I still yes. like catch myself, right? Like, oh God, there's a lot of calories. I'm like, so, so my body <laughs> needs it, <laughs> needs and it's it. the right food. And then you burn it, and it's fuel when yeah. you're doing everything right. I love that. Thank you for walking us through the Galveston diet and the fact that you wrote this book and that that your own epiphany brought you to this new level of understanding that you're sharing with everybody else. And so now that we have tackled the nutrition aspect of all of this, I'm not letting her go. Because <laughs> she's, she's my prisoner of house uh, because there was so much to unpack on the menopause side. And I am so grateful, Mary Claire, that finally, finally, menopause is getting right. the voice that it's getting and, and women are just outspoken about it. So mm -hmm. we're really going to do a deep dive on the menopause side of this, on the backside of this break. You're watching Over 50 and Flourishing. Over 50 and Flourishing with Dominique Soxa is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we hit these moments in life where it just seems like we're in the spin cycle of a dryer. <laughs> For me, it was 2021. I was going through a huge relationship change, a career change, a move. It just seemed like the rug was pulled out from under my world. So much to handle and deal with. And it's times like these where I think we have to be real and honest with ourselves when we need to seek help, when we need a therapist and a, just an outside objective voice to help guide us and listen to us when we're faced with tough choices in life. Well, that's where better help comes in. It's an entirely online service. It's therapy, it's convenient. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. All you do is fill out a questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And that way you can move forward with confidence about decisions that you're having to make around your career, your relationships, or anything else you're facing. Hey, let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash over 50 today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash over 50. Today's episode of Over 50 and Flourishing is sponsored by AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. Hey everyone, Courtney here, and I drink AG1 literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I was looking for a single solution product that would support my entire body and cover my nutritional bases every day. Dominique has actually been inspiring me to live a healthier lifestyle, but I needed a product that would support better gut health, give me an energy boost, and help my immune system. I always find myself forgetting to take pills or vitamins, so I was really wanting a product that I can incorporate into my diet and a supplement that actually takes great. For me, I drink AG1 in the morning to start my day as I'm catching up on emails and it really makes me feel energized and satisfied. I feel like I'm doing something good for my body and that I'm actually giving it the nutrition that it craves. So I know that we all love Dominique's product recommendations and I actually heard about AG1 from Dominique. But she told me that AG1 can replace my multivitamin, probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. I was sold. Also, my AG1 is delivered monthly, so I never have to think about ordering more. I'm telling you guys, this can't get any easier. So if you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash over 50. That's drinkag1.com slash over 50. Check it out. Welcome back to Over 50 and Flourishing. My guest today is just an absolute treasure. She's a treasure from the sea. She's just from down south here in Galveston, Texas, about 50 miles away from Houston. But she's just a wonder when it comes to 
Oh my gosh, all things HRT, menopause, living your best life in midlife. She's written the book, The Galveston Diet, which we've been focusing on the first half of this podcast. I really want to shift the attention now to menopause because that's really where she became viral on TikTok and Instagram and how all of you got to know her. And I just, I love this conversation about menopause and it's so open and fresh and, and your audience, my goodness, so receptive. I see just, you know, I follow the comments. I see all the questions that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's such a game changer and, you know, you were among the first to really get this out there and be a, a mouthpiece for something that we all go through. And so your history, your backstory is you were practicing ob mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, you get maybe when you're training, maybe a day in menopause training. So in, in medical school, you might, now again, I trained 30, I went to school 30 years ago. Um, you might get it, at, we got maybe an hour lecture in huh. endocrinology on menopause. That's it. And it was the end of your periods. And that's it. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> so, um, wow. Yeah. And it was always framed in terms of your fertility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did not understand the ensuing health risks mm -hmm. until I started on my own menopause journey. Yeah. Um, other than osteoporosis, I knew that one. Right. In residency, in my residency, and now I'm also speaking as a former residency program director where I was in charge of the curriculum. So, until 2018 or 2017, I know exactly what the residents were required to be taught. Now, there were some didactic, meaning lecture type things that we were required to cover, but there were no menopause clinics or focused time mm -hmm. dedicated to the care of the menopausal woman and forget perimenopause. Right. There was nothing. nothing taught about the nuances of picking it up, how to diagnose it, how to treat a patient who's suffering. And, and, and so... When I graduated from my training program, I mean, I can deliver a baby upside down, backwards, mm -hmm. inside out. I can take care of a pregnant woman. More than half of my training was spent on obstetrics, which is all important. Yeah. I learned amazing things about oncology, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, uterine cancer. I learned all kind of surgical techniques, laparoscopic, open, vaginal, to do all these different gynecologic surgeries, you know, reconstructive surgery of the pelvis for prolapse. I learned pediatric gynecology. So, so obstetrics took up, you know, 55, 60%. And then gynecology gets shoved into the box with everything else. And then you have a lot of time in the OR to mm -hmm. learn how to do these very important surgical techniques. You have tons of time on oncology because it is so important and so complicated. Pediatric gynecology got a little sliver. And then menopause just gets whatever <laughs> dust. Just, just a little fairy dust that got sprinkled. Is left. And... I thought nothing of it at the time. I remember, so I'm going to be super honest and raw here and tell you something that is 100% true and I'm so ashamed of. Mm. So there was a code for a woman that I now realize was perimenopausal and menopausal. It was a woman who came in with a lot of vague complaints. Mm -hmm. She wasn't sleeping. She was gaining some weight. She's a little bit depressed, maybe anxious. She was hurting in places. Mm -hmm. Nothing you could put your finger on, nothing like that hit a checklist for common medical condition. And we called it, we had a name for it. And it wasn't anything written in a book. Our professors never said this, but it was something kind of passed down from the upper level residents to the lower. And it was a WW, a whiny woman. Uh, isn't that something? And it would, you know, I thought nothing of it. Right. It's so shameful to me that I propagated this and that was a part of it. And um, that we completely, if we couldn't figure it out, mm -hmm. it was in her head. Right. It's all in her head. Many women were put on antidepressants and, going through <clears throat> menopause. Now, some antidepressants actually do help with hot flashes, some. Uh -huh. um, so I see where if you're terrified to give a woman hormone therapy because you'll get sued if she gets cancer, yeah. that may be an SSRI. But like this blanket recommendation of an antidepressant for menopause treatment is just outrageous to me now. Mm -hmm. And so 
we have to change this mentality. And this is part of how society views a menopausal woman. How, you know, the, have you seen the latest memes about the AI? You ask AI to draw a menopausal woman yeah. and it's this scary looking witch. Yeah, of, frazzled. Yeah, just yeah. frazzled of and like, el- like, r- like in her 80s. Yeah. And so I'm like, no, That's we're not vibrant her. and strong. And I'm at the beginning, I'm, I'm like more successful than I've ever been in my entire life. I'm helping more people than I ever have in my entire life. Yep. And I'm a menopausal woman. And I, we've got to change this narrative so we can, it's a big ship to course correct from society to how we train our, our providers to how the medical, you know, how the medical world and everyone thinks about this time of our lives, but it doesn't have to be this horrible time of suffering where we are no longer have any value left to society or the medical community. You and I are both having this conversation and this passion about it, even though coming from two different backgrounds, you the medical side, me from just a woman who went through menopause, but also as a broadcast journalist wanting to get the experience out there because my menopause experience was so brutal and caught me by surprise because I'm that type of person. I always felt good. I never had bad periods. I never had problems. You know, I'm just happy-go-lucky kind of person. And mm-hmm. it absolutely blindsided mm-hmm. me in my 40s. All the things that you talk about, the sleeplessness, the irritability, the moodiness, you know, feeling somewhat depressed. I'm like, what, me? I'm, you know, I'm always smiling. I'm always the optimist. And now I'm feeling like I'm on a sinking ship. Things that I just didn't understand And I didn't, at that time, I was seeking some help and I was getting some therapy, but now I realized that what I was getting wasn't enough and it was just progesterone and the the lack of estrogen in my body Mm -hmm. was really what was triggering all of that to happen. And so it came in late for me. Thankfully, it came in. But I want to start with perimenopause Mm -hmm. because really that's where it all begins. That's when we feel like we are starting to absolutely break down. And there are physiological reasons for why all of this is happening. Right. So so explain to women sure. what is going on in their so body. So let's start with some basic definitions. So, and a lot of this is really misunderstood. Menopause is one day in your life. Right. It is one day after your last, one year to the day mm-hmm. after your last menstrual period. So it signifies a lot of things. Yes. Um, perimenopause is the time period between that day and your normal, Mm -hmm. the end of your normal reproductive cycles. Okay. When, when I say normal, when the estrogen depletion wasn't really affecting your body yet. Right. Okay. And then postmenopause is menopause till you die. on. (laughs) Until you're done. (laughs) Right. And perimenopause can begin seven to 10 years. Like the effect of perimenopause Mm -hmm. in your body can begin seven to 10 years before your period stops. So if the average age of menopause is 51, but normal is still 45 to 55, you can be as early as 35 Mm -hmm. and begin your perimenopause journey and begin having symptoms when almost uniformly patients are being told you're too young. Right. You're too young. It's impossible. And that's just not true. Right. So what happens to that woman who, so, let's say, is in her late 30s right. or early and 40s here's something, and thinking, this is not I me? I think I was told in med school and residency, but it just didn't really register. And I remember reading it again like a few years ago and being like, now it makes sense. So we are born with all of our eggs and our ovaries, mm-hmm. okay? They actually form in utero and we hit our ma- maximum egg count at 20 weeks, so five when your mom was five months pregnant with, you know, our mothers were five months pregnant with us, right. is when we had the most amount of eggs, okay? And they start declining at 20 weeks. So they're declining from the day we're born, they decline all through puberty, and then you start ovulating. So by the time we hit 30, we're down to about 10% on average of wow. the egg, of the, you know, follicle count. Right. By the time we hit 40, we're down to 3%. Mm-hmm. And so the symptoms of, of lower estrogen kind of depends on genetics and environment, when you're going to start feeling that or when your body's going to start registering, hey, 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 estrogen depletion, it's getting really hard for me to get my estrogen levels up. Like there's mm-hmm. just a few eggs left and they're all holding hands, trying their best. <laughs> Stay but together. The egg quality, and then because <laughs> right. we're born with those eggs, the egg quality, the quality of those eggs, their ability to yes. like produce estrogen and be, viable. Dec- <laughs> and be viable begins to decline as well. So once that last little egg kind of dies off, yeah. 
then you start replacing all of the stroma in the ovary with fibrosis. And so eventually your ovaries will basically, after several years of menopause, be undetectable. You won't even see them. Wow. So how does a woman know that this is even going on? And It's a great question. And she's and probably this thinking, is, a, is it too early to even seek treatment? So... Because we have almost no studies done in perimenopause or no uniform way to diagnose perimenopause, that's a good question. Seriously. So there's not a, unfortunately, we do not have a blood test that, or a urine or a saliva test that is going to accurately diagnose perimenopause. The hallmark of perimenopause is decreasing rates of ovulation. So where you yes. used to ovulate, uh, now if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome or you don't ovulate, mm -hmm. good luck because they look very similar you know, to each other. So a one-time blood test might pick up that you're not ovulating regularly. It might look, to it usually looks totally normal and your doctor's like, you're fine, this isn't menopause. It's not menopause, it's which is menopause. the end. Right. So perimenopause right now is diagnosed clinically. You have to listen to the patient, you have to believe her. You may do other blood work to make sure that there's a, not other conditions that look the same, mm -hmm. like hypothyroidism or yes. not other autoimmune disease or anemia or nutrition deficiency, which is what I do in my clinic. And then you start treatment. And that treatment would look like what? So it depends. Again, mm -hmm. an art here rather than so much of a science because we don't have a lot of studies. Yeah. So when we talk about support during perimenopause, we're giving you back estrogen and progesterone that your body's not making on a normal, regular basis. Mm -hmm. That could look like a low-dose birth control pill for some women, especially if she's also having cramps and really heavy periods or acne associated with her perimenopause. We want to suppress ovulations. In order to do that, we need a higher dose. Right. Menopause therapy doses, remember, are just meant to give you the health benefits and get your symptoms at bay, mm -hmm. which is a percentage of the dose of that's in a birth control pill. And there's not a lot of difference other than, than some chemical formulations of what's commercially available mm -hmm. at between the two. So when I talk about perimenopause, we're usually talking in higher doses because we've got a little bit, we're trying to sometimes suppress ovulation. If it's at the end of perimenopause, we could just go ahead and start menopause Treatment. Dosing, mm -hmm. treatment uh, in the lower doses because we're just trying to get you back up to a baseline level. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think for me, the biggest mistake, like I said, was only progesterone mm -hmm. and not getting the estrogen and when I need it. progesterone can help some of the symptoms. Yeah. It can help with sleep. It can help some, not so much with hot flashes, yeah. but it can help with some anxiety at night. Yes. Um, but really the thing that's going to help the most people almost all of the time for the most symptoms is going to be estrogen. Yeah, yeah. It, there are so many different types of HRT out there. Mm -hmm. There are patches, there are pills, there are creams, there are pellets. <laughs> I mean, it's, and, and as I've come to find out, um, Oscar's going to join the podcast. Um, as I've come to find out, it's, it's not one size fits all. No. I mean, I've I've got a, I got a patch here. I take a progesterone capsule. I've got a testosterone little pellet. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's like a little bit of everything. Right. So, how do you kind of figure out that magic formula per woman? The great question. So, when we look at first, we look at there's different ways to get it in your body, mm -hmm. and then there's different formulations of of how to get it in, you know. So I try to stick with the FDA approved mm -hmm. regulated options because I know there's a 98% chance of what they say is in that box is in that box or right. in that pill, you know, if it's regulated. If we're going with a compounded option, then there's a lot of flexibility, miss, flexibility. you know, you have a little more um, mm -hmm. prescribing flexibility. But you know, it just depends on who's behind the counter and what they're putting in there. Sure. And, you know, we, we do see when it's tested, there's a lot more variation coming mm -hmm. out, you know, on that end. So um, we have oral. So let's talk about estrogen first. Sure. We have oral and non-oral. Oral works great. It gets your bones stronger, helps the general urinary system. It does all the things medically, but there are a little bit higher risk with it. Mm -hmm. Oral has a higher risk of blood clots because of the first pass effect in the liver. So uh -huh. when that bump of estrogen hits the liver, comes through the gastrointestinal tract, everything we eat and ingest goes to the liver right. for processing, as I point to my liver. <laughs> um, so we do see a slight uptick in the clotting factors. And so for um, a 7 out of 10,000 women, we'll have a blood clot 
who otherwise would not have over her baseline. Okay. So by choosing a non-oral option, such as a gel or a patch or maybe a cream, we can negate that effect. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women who are under the assumption or were told by someone who hasn't kept up with the literature, you're not a candidate because you have this family history of clotting or you've had a mm -hmm. blood clot, you know, you actually might be a candidate. Yeah, you're just for, saying it's the delivery system. It's the delivery system of the estrogen that's the problem. The progesterone, most people who know what they're doing are doing the oral micronized progesterone. Yes. Um, progesterone in a cream form is a very large molecule. It's not readily absorbed through the skin. There's a mm -hmm. lot of, um, it's really hard to get at high enough levels to protect the endometrium. So mm -hmm. we would never recommend a cream for progesterone um, if you're taking estrogen at the same time because your risk of endometrial cancer is higher. So, and when the, there was a great study out of France, I think they had 80,000 patients they looked at. It was an observational study and they looked at the type of progestin that they were on and the risk of breast cancer. Um, because it does seem like it's the progestin in the, um, in the HRT that causes that, that is linked to breast, I don't want to say causes, yes, that is linked, linked to. to breast cancer, um, rather than the estrogen that um, oral micronized progesterone had n very little, if any, increased risk. It seemed to be the safest version. Yes. So most people in my world who follow the evidence are recommending the oral micronized progesterone. Wasn't it, back to that study, was it the NIH study, um, which was the one that had... The WHI, the Women's Health Initiative. WHI. That was put on by the NIH, yeah. Got it. And that was one that had progestin in it, correct? Yeah, so, so they only looked at Primarin and Primpro. Yes. Which were the top prescribed you know, forms at the time, yep. the, the, um, compounding industry hadn't taken off, right. um, at that time. So most women were getting Primarin or Primpro. And so, did it um, come from horse urine? So Primarin stands for pregnant mare urine. Mm -hmm. And so they were extracting the estrogen from the urine of pregnant mares. I don't prescribe that. I have, not that I don't think it works well. I just have ethical problems yes. with how they extract it. I'm, come from a horse loving family and yeah. I'm just, I have other options for my patients that work amazingly well without mm -hmm. torturing a horse. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. Got it. Um, so, um, the, I lost my train of thought. The progestin. The progestin. Yeah. So, um, so the progestin in it was medroxy progesterone acetate. Okay. Which is Provera. And it was the Provera, the patients who took the Provera, not the estrogen only arm that had the increased risk of breast cancer, even though they were at a much lower stage and had a higher chance of survival versus placebo mm -hmm. patients who were diagnosed. And so I avoid Provera for that reason. Right. And oral micronized progesterone is body identical. It's non-synthetic and it seems to be, have the lowest risks associated with it. So that's pretty much all I prescribe. Yeah. It's interesting because whenever I, whenever there's discussion about HRT, whether I see it on your end or I talk about it, it's inevitable. The comments of, you know, I don't do it. It increases the risk of cancer. You know, you're, why put yourself at risk for blah, blah, blah. What's, what's your take on this? And, and <laughs> <laughs> I know what your take is, but, but go ahead and elaborate. And, and is there somebody who truly isn't a candidate for any of absolutely. this? Absolutely. Okay. There are always medications that people, sh certain people with risk factors. So we have absolute contraindications to estrogen, to progestin, to um, even testosterone. Mm -hmm. So um, in the HRT family, when we say HRT as obstetricians and gynecologists in the health profession, we are only talking about estrogen plus or minus progesterone. Mm -hmm. Testosterone come, falls, it is hormone therapy, yep. but it's it falls into a different category. category. So we talk about that separately. Right. Um, so um, the, I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> <laughs> menopause. Welcome menopause. Menopause. <laughs> menopause. So, oh, so who's, who wouldn't who's be not, a candidate? Contraindications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So absolute contraindications. If you have <laughs> undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Okay. So you are having no, not normal periods for you. Right. You should not be on hormone therapy. You mm. need to go get that evaluated and treated because okay. we could be feeding a cancer. Got it. Got it. If you have active breast cancer, that needs to be evaluated, treated, managed before you ever consider hormone therapy or even if you're a candidate. If somebody's had breast cancer in the it past. It depends. Okay. It's a very individualized decision. It really depends on what stage, what type. But there are people who are breast cancer survivors who are successfully taking hormone therapy. Okay. Now, they may have had mastectomies and, and oophorectomies and, yes. you know. Um, but I know OB-GYNs who've had breast cancer who are taking 
hormone therapy successfully, very low dose. Okay. But again, very, very one-on-one individual decision right. making, it's not, not a blanket, blanket recommendation at all. At yeah. all. Um, there are people who have had a active blood clot or mm-hmm. a clot in the last six months who stop everything until we figure this out, what caused it, and then then reevaluate later to see if you're a candidate. Right. Um, blood pressure, elevated blood pressure is not a contraindication. Matter of fact, the American Heart Association just came out with a recommendation showing it was oral estrogen, not transdermal, <laughs> right. that increased the risk. So, you know, people who've been walking around their whole lives to saying, I can't take it, I've been told I can't take it, my sister had breast cancer, this is not true. Mm-hmm. So... You know, and you need to find someone who's versed in the latest recommendations yeah. and studies and not stuck in the 2000s and fear mongering and before you make a decision. Now, I'm not saying every woman needs to be on hormone therapy, but you deserve the conversation. Every woman needs a conversation. Yes, for so sure. So she can make an informed choice for herself. Right. You talked about the transdermal estrogen. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that a lot of women take it vaginally Mm -hmm. to help with vaginal dryness. Exactly. Is that separate though? Separate. Okay. So, and I love some. I love vaginal estrogen treatment. The vaginal estrogen is meant to act locally. So Mm -hmm. think about like you run into Walgreens and grab some cortisone if you've got a rash. Yes. Versus taking oral prednisone. When we do systemic therapy, we're treating from scalp to vag, you know, um, I'm stealing Naomi Watts' words (laughs) from stripes. (laughs) Right. So we're treating your entire body. When we're treating with vaginal estrogen, it's a very, very low dose Mm -hmm. and it's meant to act locally. It's a percentage of what you would get in systemic therapy. Got it. So I had a, a, asked a, I do a once a week, um, ask me anything on Instagram. And there was a big thread that came out of, you know, I'm using vaginal estrogen. When is it safe for me to have relations with my partner? Partner. And I thought, wow, these women don't realize it's such a low dose. Right. Unless he has the world's most absorbent penis, he it's <laughs> he, not going to. Fa- they boobs. are terrified <laughs> that it's going to give him gynecomastia. I'm like, no, no, no. no. Right. I mean, and I, at first I thought they were asking, is it a lubricant? I'm like, yes. no, vaginal estrogen over time can help you naturally lubricate yes. yourself, but it is not a lubricant. No, no, we're asking, <laughs> when is it safe after sex yeah. or during, you know, before sex? And I was like, anytime. Anytime. You're anytime. good. He's good. He's good. <laughs> That's Nothing. hilarious. Nothing. Um, so anyone can use vaginal okay. estrogen, even with contraindications to systemic. Right. No increased risk. Breast cancer. Breast cancer, heart attack, blood clots, none of that. That's just to help the tissue in the vagina to be more lubricated like it was, I guess, in the earlier. Yes. Yes. So when you biopsy a pre- and postmenopausal vagina, premenopausal is thick, velvety, lots of mucus glands. You know, under a microscope, it looks like a mountain. Okay. Now let's fast forward it three years after your menopause. It looks like the Sahara Desert. Mm. It is thin, easily friable, but which means terrible. You which know, which is why women have pain, right? And so things you lose your elasticity, and so it can be horrifically painful. And I know women who are white knuckling it through mm. relations and absolutely have lost all desire because they hurt. Yeah, I'm like, we. This is fixable. Right. This is an easy fix. And once you stop hurting that libido may come right back. Yeah, yeah. We talked about testosterone as sort of a side component Mm -hmm. to all of this. I know you're more in favor of a lower dose, if at all. When is that um, a potential factor for a woman? Sure. So we know that studies in postmenopause have shown that for low libido, which let me clarify that. Libido is not really a medical term. Um, in, In medicine, we say hypoactive sexual desire disorder, where other causes of sexual dysfunction have been ruled out. So when we talk about sexual function in a woman and why she may not be happy, okay, I, I call it, and Kelly and I call it the want to want. If, yeah. if you ever follow her, Kelly Casperson, she's a magnificent, you know, she's the mage for um, sexual wellness in women. Okay. And so there's five buckets. So we have a relationship disorder. So no amount of, of hormones is going to fix that. Mm-hmm. You know? That's right. And so you have to have a good, solid partner or someone that you want. You have to want to want it. Yes. And if you don't want to want it, yeah. I can't fix that for you. <laughs> you know? Right. And so then we have desire, which is what happens in the brain. We have arousal disorder, which is what happens in the pelvis. So Mm -hmm. that is the physiologic response to a stimulus. So that is, you know, sometimes you might have a nerve conduction disorder, longstanding diabetes, you have nerve injury where you're not getting the signals to the pelvis, even though your brain is like, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's treated 
sometimes vaginal Viagra works for that. Interesting. There is an orgasmic disorder. Yeah. So women who either have primary anorgasmia where they've never had an orgasm, and I have patients like that, they've learned to live with it. It's up to 10% of women. Wow. If that happened to 10% of men, oh, it, it would be, be a outrage. national emergency. Yes. Right. I mean, the FDA would have cleared, you know, and so, um, and then there's pain. Yeah. So if it's uncomfortable and this is not enjoyable for you, nobody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So we need to fix the pain before we address the other issues. Testosterone is good for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And yeah. it's not for everyone. Again, desire is still very complicated. Where I joke with my patients, a man looks like a light switch, usually on. Yeah. A female... It's, it's like a, a dimmer. Flight deck of a 747. <laughs> <laughs> and so a dimmer switch. A dimmer and so bar. testosterone yeah. can be helpful for that. Okay. Now I'm using some testosterone off-label with my patients who mm -hmm. have sarcopenia. So mm -hmm. they have very low muscle mass and I'm worried about their long-term risks. Yes. And they're doing the protein intake and they're doing the resistance training. Yep. And testosterone can be helpful there. Now there's some anecdotal evidence, observational studies that are suggestive. Maybe it's great for brain health and some other things, but I don't have enough like clear-cut clinical evidence to blanket recommend testosterone for everyone. Okay. We also, thank you FDA, don't mm -hmm. have an approved option for women. So we've got to go to compounding measures often for that. And that's okay. what I do for my patients as well. Makes sense. Everybody's thinking about HRT for mitigating menopause, but the long-term health benefits. That's right. what I really want you to elaborate on because we're not just living into our 50s, but we want to have great right. lives in our 70s, 80s, and maybe even 90s. So we're, we're being asked to live 30 sometimes 40 years, right. average of 30, with no... Hormones. Hormones. Yeah. From our ovaries, yeah, whatsoever. You're, you're going to bury me with a patch on, by the so, way. So, same. Yeah. And I, I'm i like, no, there's only a couple of species of whales, and I think they just found a giraffe might do it. But like, most mammals do not have menopause. Now, mm -hmm. there's a lot of the sociobiologists are looking at why this might be, and the grandmother hypothesis, but you know, I, the fact of the matter is, very few species live this long without hormones. Sure. And I get a lot of kickback from people who are like, well, isn't this meant to be? This is a natural process. Yes. Why are we doing this? I'm like, listen, natural does not mean it's not harmful. Right. Cancer is a natural process. Um, uh, presbyopia mm -hmm. is a natural process. Erectile dysfunction is a natural process. Right. And that no one is coming after the guys for, other than maybe an unhappy partner, for for treating that. Yeah. And so we, but besides hot flashes, night sweats, and those do go away. It might take 14 years, but, you know. I wouldn't make it. We <laughs> have serious health consequences having to do with our menopause, where yes. we used to enjoy a much lower rate of heart disease. We catch up with our male counterparts. That's right. All of a sudden, Alzheimer's, you know, the neurodementia becomes a thing that we never had to deal with before. Right. And so estrogen, as it turns out, women who go through menopause naturally younger have higher health risks than those who go through naturally older hmm. because of the loss of estrogen. Yes, yeah, so early on. So early on. And premature menopause, which is below the age of 40, your risk of stroke dramatically increases, heart attack increases. So, so the American Heart Association went and looked back at the WHI data and they said, hey, women who were treated with estrogen early, mm. meaning early into their menopause, have lower risk of cardiovascular disease and lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease. And oh, by the way, lower all-cause mortality. Interesting. So there's something protective about estrogen, and, and now they're calling it the healthy cell hypothesis. Whereas estrogen is better at protecting a healthy cell than stopping a disease process once it gets started. Right. So there is a window of opportunity for a woman, especially in the neurodegenerative and, and the heart disease realm, where estrogen might be protective. Now, there was a very recent study that got a lot of press that came out on dementia. Mm-hmm. And so I've gotten a lot of questions about that recently. So temporally, let's talk about this. Yep. Now, God bless the press. There's been <laughs> multiple articles that have come out in support of hormone therapy in early menopause, being protective for multiple, you know, in studies for neurodementia. Right. And they just skipped over those and ignored them and went right to the one that was fear-mongering yep. and gave it press. Now you know why I'm not in it anymore. So here's, <laughs> here's what I tell patients. Here's when everyone's asking me, you know, there's lots of doctors who have weighed in on this. Yeah. Menopause causes dementia. Menopause. Mm -hmm. 
And a woman who is severe, the only women getting HRT right now are the ones who are severely suffering and basically going in and demanding hormone Correct. therapy or they're going to kill themselves, yep. you know, which is how most women are getting it. This is sad, but true. Like yep. I have no option. Mm -hmm. You must give this to me. The more serious your menopause symptoms are, the higher your health risks are. Yep. And so these women are being treated with severe symptoms who were most likely going to develop dementia anyway, is what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. Menopause causes dementia, not hormone therapy. Right. They were just happened to have been treated. And they were, you know, so we need a, this was an observational study, did not prove causation. And we need a lot more money and a lot more research mm -hmm. in this area immediately. Absolutely. Just as we've needed on menopause forever. 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 So I want, you know, your followers to do an experiment with mm -hmm. me. Go to PubMed, which is a public, you know, med where we have like really good medical research journal articles, everything that's vetted and, you know. Oh, it, so it's published medical information. Published medical research. Right. And just type in the word pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I believe the last time I did it, there were 1.1 million articles. Amazing, right? Right. 1.1 million. Stu that's that's 1.1 million researchers, research dollars, students being taught. Okay, now put in just the word menopause. I'm afraid. And to when ask. I did it, it was 94,000. Wow. More women will go through menopause than have babies. Yep. Yep. But that's how our society is functioning. That's how our medical care is functioning. That's where the dollars and the brain power mm -hmm. and the energy is going. Why are we suddenly less the minute our, our ability to have a child? Yes. It goes away. Gone. Yep. And yet we're the largest growing sector of the population and also the money spending the money sector. sector. Yeah. Things are changing yeah. and it's conversations like these and dialogues like these and people like you who are saying enough is enough. You know, I spent my time on one side of this and I have seen a huge void on the other. And I'm now placing my emphasis and my time and my care for women who desperately need it. So, and same. I'm so I so left grateful. traditional OB-GYN to open a menopause clinic. Yeah. So, so I could focus on the people who needed me the most. That's right. I have no regrets on what I did in the past, yep. on the residents I taught, on the babies I delivered. I miss them. I get to see them because I live in a small town. Sure. They're adults But now. now I get to serve women who so desperately need it. Women sit in my office and cry mm -hmm. and are just so grateful to be validated and yes. recognized and told it's going to be okay and we're going to figure this out mm. together. Isn't that great? What a beautiful feeling for you. It is. Yeah. I'm so grateful. I, I want to make sure that everybody can follow you who's listening to us. So we're going to link the book. We're going to link your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, maryclairewellness.com? Yeah. Okay, we'll make sure to link that. And I also want to quickly mention uh, when this podcast airs, you're also launching a meal service right. that coincides with the recipes and meal planning in your book, which right. is exciting. Very exciting. A lot of, of, of my followers, patients, you know, are struggling with meal planning or just want some backup something for backup so they're not reaching in the pantry for something. Yes. And so we have um, we have a new partnership with a meal delivery service for Galveston Diet, and that that is so proud of and so excited for people to be able to take advantage of if they need it. That's awesome. Well, thank you for making the drive into Houston today. I'm Thanks so for having glad. me. Oh, my gosh, any time. There's so much to talk about. I feel like I can have you back <laughs> a, a hundred times, and there's still you know more hours to discuss. But we're scratching the surface, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate you and what you're doing for women in midlife. Thank you. Such an awesome conversation. I'm so glad that we were able to sort of split this in two, talk about nutrition, and then also menopause. If you're watching on YouTube and you have any questions for Dr. Haver, go ahead and leave them in the comment section below. Also, let me know who you would like to see on this channel. I We are so open and receptive to your suggestions. As always, subscribe on the YouTube side. And same thing if you're listening on a podcast, rate, review, subscribe, and share. Those things are so important because they help to grow the platform. They make it bigger. And then we can even get bigger, greater, even more people on this channel. Anybody you want, I'm determined to get. So please do all of that. And I look forward to seeing you next week.